We're turning your Bible to the book of Genesis chapter 33. And as you're turning there, let me explain a few things. Chapter 33 is divided into two parts. The first part tells us what happened when Jacob and Esau finally met after being separated for a period of over 20 years. If you remember, Jacob ran away. Now, it was because his mother encouraged him to do that, but Jacob ran away because Esau had threatened to kill him. So there was definitely bad blood between the two. And what's interesting is that as you're reading the story, you realize that there's a lot of tension building up to this part of the story. Is Esau still mad? Does Esau still want to kill Jacob? We don't know. That's why there's this tension that's building up to this part of the story. But to be honest with you, when they finally do mate, it's really kind of anticlimactic. And you'll see why I say that when we get to that part of the story. So the first part is all about uh, what happens when Jacob and Esau meet after a period of being separated for 20 years. That's verses 1 through 11. The second part explains how Jacob and Esau parted ways. And once that happens, then Esau is forgotten. And we're not going to hear about him until Isaac dies and he's at the funeral. But that's just kind of a brief little thing. Look at Genesis chapter 35, verse number 29, and you'll see what I'm talking about. And Isaac gave up the ghost and died and was gathered unto his people, being old and full of days. And his sons, Esau and Jacob, buried him. So we're not going to hear about Esau anymore until we get to the part where Isaac dies. And this is all we hear about him. He helped Jacob to bury his father. Now, chapter 36 goes through a list of Esau's descendants, but technically, his role in the story is over after, after chapter 33. So, let's see what happened when Jacob and Esau finally met after being separated for 20 years. Look at verses 1 through 3. Then Jacob looked up, and he saw Esau coming with his 400 men, so he divided the children among Leah, Rachel and his two servant wives. He put the servant wives and their children at the front, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph last. Then Jacob went on ahead. As he approached his brother, he bowed to the ground seven times before him. Now, as the sun was coming up, which was right after his wrestling match with the Lord, Jacob looked up and he saw Esau coming with his army of 400 men. So he divided his family into three groups. The first group consisted of his two concubines and their children, Bilhah and her sons Dan and Naphtali. Now if you grew up in Cherokee County, it's Naphtali. You go to Israel, it's Naphtali. And Zilpah and her sons Gad and Asher. And they were placed at the front of the pack, first in line. The second group consisted of Leah and her children. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Essachar, and Zebulun, and one daughter. Now, she's not mentioned at this point, but she will be in the next chapter, and it's Dinah. This group was placed in the middle of the pack. They were second in line. The last group consisted of Rachel and her son, Joseph. Now, some of you are thinking, well, she had another son, Benjamin, but he wasn't born yet. Now, Jacob placed them at the very end of the pack. And they were the last group. And then Jacob went out to meet Esau. Look at verse number 3 again. Then Jacob went on ahead as he approached his brother. He bowed to the ground seven times before him. Now, there's been a lot of speculation as to why Jacob divide, divided his family into three groups. And most commentators believe that he did that as a precaution. In other words, he divided his family into three groups, just like he divided his camp into two groups. Do you remember when he did that? That was back in the last chapter, Genesis chapter 32, verses 6 through 8. After delivering the message, the messengers returned to Jacob and reported, We met your brother Esau, and he was already on his way to meet you with an army of 400 men. Jacob was terrified at the news. He divided his household along with the flocks and, her and herds and camels into two groups. He thought, if Esau meets one group and attacks it, perhaps the other group can escape. Now, when he separated these two groups, he didn't put them side by side. He staggered them and put a large distance between the two, hoping that when Esau came to the first group, if he meant to attack them, he wouldn't even know there's a second group, but they would have scouts out and they would be able to scatter and run. So as you can see, the whole reason that he divided his camps into two groups was because in case Esau did attack him, then the second group could escape. That's why he did it. So most commentators think that he was doing the very same thing with his family. They think that he was dividing his family into three groups just in case 
Esau did attack. And hopefully, those in the back of the pack would be able to escape. And of course, when you look at how he divided the groups and where he placed them, it makes sense. His concubines and his sons or children by his concubines were placed at the front of the pack. Leah, who was not his favorite wife, was placed in the middle of the pack along with her children. And Rachel, the one he loved the most, along with her son Joseph, were placed in the back of the pack. So it looks like Jacob is actually playing favorites. And if he was, you can see why Joseph's brothers hated him. Because Jacob played favorites. But I disagree with most commentators, and you're going to see why in just a little bit. I don't believe that Jacob divided his family into three groups with that purpose in mind. I believe that after his ras wrestling, sorry, that's that Cherokee County, after his wrestling match with the Jesus Christ, with the Lord, Jacob had no doubt that God would come to his protection or to his aid if he needed him. That's why he walked out to meet Esau in front of everyone. He was totally confident that God was going to protect him and his family no matter what. So why in the world did he divide his family into three groups? Well, let me explain why. At that time, whenever you met a dignitary, it was customary to formally introduce your wives and children, especially if the dignitary asked about them. And you didn't just introduce them in some type of random fashion. Oh, you guys come up here, let me just introduce you. No, you didn't do that. There was actually a formal presentation. And Jacob considered Esau to be a dignitary. In fact, let me show you something interesting. Look at the last part of verse number 3 again. Then Jacob went on ahead. As he approached his brother, he bowed to the ground seven times. Now, the proof is in the pudding. You always have to look at the details. God puts details in the Bible for a reason. We now know because of the Tel El Armana tablets that whenever a king was approached, you were required to bow seven times before him. So when Jacob bowed seven times before Esau, it was a token of respect and recognition that Esau was the ruler of that region. That army of 400 men that he was bringing with him was his army. That's also why the land he was living in was known at the time as Seir. Seir means hairy, shaggy, hair all over. And if you remember, Esau was a very hairy man. In fact, that's what Esau means in their language. But that's also what Seir meant. Let's go a little bit further. Not only that, but Seir eventually became known as Edom. Edom was Esau's nickname. Look at Genesis chapter 25, verse number 30. Esau said to Jacob, I'm starved, give me some of that red stew. This is how Esau got his other name, Edom, which means red. Now here's what's interesting. He is now living in an area known as Seir, which is hairy. That's what he's known for anyway. He's hairy all over. Later, the name of Seir gets changed to Edom, which is the nickname of Esau. When he comes riding up with an army of 400 men, it is known as his army. So the only conclusion that we can come to is that he was the ruler of Seir. He had become the king, and he ruled over the land that was just south and east of the Dead Sea. Now, let's get back to Jacob's family. I want you to notice what happened when Esau asked about his women and children, or asked about the women and children standing behind him. Look at verses 5 through 7. Then Esau looked at the women and children and asked, Who are these people with you? These are the children God has graciously given to me, your servant, Jacob replied. Then the servant wives came forward with their children and bowed before him. Next came Leah with her children, and they bowed before him. Finally, Joseph and Rachel came forward and bowed before him. Now, as you can see, they weren't a great distance away. After he bowed to the ground, he looks out there and he says, Who are these women and children? They aren't a great distance away, ready to run at the first sign of danger. No, they're right there. They were right behind Jacob, and they were arranged in the groups and in the order that Jacob had placed them. So once again, we read into the story things that aren't there. 
But if we'll read it according to the customs of the time and you notice what Jacob did and how he did it, you realize one thing. Esau ruled that area. He was thought of as a king. And Jacob was treating him that way. So let me emphasize the only reason that Jacob divided his family into three groups was so that he could make a formal introduction. Now, let's jump back to verse number four because I skipped it to make my point. Look back at verse number four. Then Esau ran to meet him and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they both wept. Now remember, Jacob walked out in front of everyone and began bowing before him seven times. As I said, that was a sign of respect and recognition that Esau was a king, that he was the ruler of the land of Seir. So as Jacob was bowing before him, Esau jumps off of his horse and he runs to Jacob. And he throws his arms around him and he begins kissing him and then they both start crying. In essence, this was a very sweet reunion and there were no hard feelings between the two. And that's why I say this is really kind of anticlimactic because you see this tension and this building all the way up to this part of the story. And you read about Esau coming with his army of 400 men and the first thing you think is, oh no, God's going to have to miraculously deliver Jacob. But what we see is a sweet reunion. Esau has forgiven his brother. He loves him. And he wants reconciliation just as much as Jacob does. But again, I, I want to emphasize how wise Jacob was because Jacob didn't come back putting on airs. Jacob came back and he was a very humble person. He gave God credit for everything that God had done for him, but at the same time, he went ahead and humbled himself and elevated his brother Esau. Now, look at verses 8 through 11. And what were all the flocks and herds I met as I came, Esau asked. Jacob replied, they are a gift, my lord, to ensure your friendship. My brother, I have plenty, Esau answered. Keep what you have for yourself. But Jacob insisted, no, if I have found favor with you, please accept this gift for me. And what a relief to see your friendly smile. It's like seeing the face of God. Please take this gift I have brought you, for God has been very gracious to me. I have more than enough. And because Jacob insisted, Esau finally accepted the gift. Now, if you know anything about the Middle East and the customs of that time, you know, before you even read it, that Esau is going to accept the gifts. How many of you knew that Esau was going to accept the gifts? Yeah, you just knew that. Because the customs at that time demanded that Esau should initially decline or refuse to take Jacob's gifts. But it also demanded that Jacob should continue to insist until finally Esau gave in. And then out of courtesy, he would accept Jacob's gifts. Oh, you're making a fool out of yourself. Okay, just for you, I'll do it. Because anything less than that would have been considered rude. But at the same time, if Esau hadn't insisted until, e or if Jacob hadn't insisted until Esau finally accepted the gifts, there would have been hard feelings. Because the way it would have looked, it would have looked as if Jacob didn't respect him. He did not recognize his position of authority and power. And people, that's just the way it works in the Middle East at that time, and it still works that way today. I'll be honest with you, most of you didn't catch that, and you thought this was just a, a, a big debate between the GOPs and the Democrats, and the GOPs were trying to make President Obama look bad. But do you remember when... Uh, Obama bowed to the, the king of Saudi Arabia. Why did we make such a big deal out of it? Because in that area, that was a sign of weakness because the king, president, of a greater country bowed to their king. And they saw that as a sign of weakness. And if you know the customs of the Middle East, that should have been taboo. You should not have done that at all. Now, some commentators make a big deal about the number of animals that Jacob gave to Esau. If you remember, he gave 580 animals to Esau. 200 female goats and 20 male goats. 200 sheep and 20 rams. 30 camels, each with a crea. That's a calf, but technically they don't have calves, they have crea. 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys for a total of 580 animals. And a lot of commentators said, whoa, he went overboard, but he was trying to appease him. 
No, they don't understand that that was the type of gift that you gave to a king. It was supposed to be excessive and it was meant to procure his favor. To not give a gift or to give a measly gift would have been seen as a sign of disrespect. It would have been a sign that you didn't respect or recognize his position of authority or his power. So Jacob had probably heard that Esau had traveled away from the family. He'd gone to live among his relatives. And he had risen to a, 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 an extreme position of power. When he finds out that he's bringing this army of 400 men, he realizes, my brother's a king. He's ruling over this area. And so he's going to give a gift that's appropriate for who his brother is. So what I'm telling you is that Jacob's gift to Esau wasn't excessive. It wasn't over the top. It's what you gave to a ruler. A king. Let me give you some examples of this. Look with me, if you would, in the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter 9, verse number 9. Then she gave the king a gift of 9,000 pounds of gold, great quantities of spices and precious jewels. Never before had there been spices as fine as those the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. Now, of course, where Queen of Sheba was from was the very bottom of Saudi Arabia at that time. But she's going to bring in all of this gold, all of these precious jewels, all of these spices. And why did she give so much? 9,000 pounds of gold. How much is gold going for now? Is it down to $1,700 an ounce? Something like that, $1,600 an ounce, 16 ounces to a pound. I mean, you do the math unbelievable but here's the principle the greater the king's power the greater the gift one of the reasons that we're always hearing about what people gave Solomon is because of the custom at that time the greater the power of the king the greater the gift and you didn't come to a king unless you gave gifts to him you wanted to procure his favor so that's why he received such great gifts now look at 2nd Kings chapter 20 verse 12 Soon after this, Merodach, Baladan, son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent Hezekiah his best wishes and a gift. For he had heard that Hezekiah had been very sick. Now I want you to notice, even kings gave other kings gifts. That's just what you did. So the gifts that Jacob gave to Esau was given as a sign of respect and recognition of his position and power. Now look at verses 12 through 16. Well, Esau said, let's be going. I will lead the way. But Jacob replied, you can see, my lord, that some of the children are very young, and the flocks and herds, ha herds have their young too. If they are driven too hard, even for one day, all the animals could die. Please, my lord, go ahead of your servant. We will follow slowly at a pace that is comfortable for the livestock and the children. I will meet you at Seir. All right, Esau said, but at least let me assign some of my men to guide and protect you. Jacob responded, that's not necessary. It's enough that you've received me warmly, my Lord. So Esau turned around and started back to Seir that same day. Now again, if you don't understand the customs of that time in that area of the world, you'll jump to the wrong conclusions. And let me explain why I say that. First of all, Esau automatically assumed that Jacob would be coming to his home. Look at verse number 12 again. Well, Esau said, let's be going. I will lead the way. You see, custom dictated that Esau be hospitable. And part of being hospitable was inviting people to your home. So Esau was expected to bring Jacob back home. But he lived in Seir, which wasn't a part of Canaan. And where did God tell Jacob to go? You go back home to Canaan. That is the land that I'm going to give to you and your descendants. So Jacob had to say no, but he had to do it in a very polite way. And the most polite way was to make an excuse. So Jacob made the customary excuse. Look at verse number 13. But Jacob replied, You can see, my Lord, that some of the children are very young, and the flocks and the herds have their young too. If they are driven too hard, even for one day, all the animals could die. So there's the customary acceptable excuse. But I want you to notice that it looks like Jacob just out and out lied. Look at the last part of verse number 14. Please, my Lord, go ahead of your servant. We will follow slowly at a pace that is comfortable for the livestock and the children. I will meet you 
at Seir. Did he go to Seir? No. Immediately, when Esau takes off with all of his men, Jacob turns around, crosses back over the Jabbok Spring, and then he goes to the Jordan Valley, sets up a place that he refers to as Sokot, and he stays there for about 18 months and then follows on and goes on to Shechem. He never did this. So a lot of commentators look at the last part of verse number 14, and they say that Jacob just out and out lied to Esau. That look, there's his character again. They say that he never had any intention of going to see her, but again, they don't understand that part of the culture. What he told Esau was meant to show good intentions, but it wasn't meant to be taken literally. And that's why people get in trouble in the Middle East. Because the customs are so different. The culture is so different. I'm going to give you a a really interesting example of how even today it can get you into trouble if you go over to the Middle East. And I'll get to that in just a little bit. But I want you to understand what Jacob said really meant, I hope to come to your home one day, but not today. You see, to refuse hospitality was almost as rude as not offering hospitality. So there's always the promise of accepting their hospitality sometime in the future. How many of you remember watching the movie The Godfather? How many of you have seen the movie The Godfather? Do you remember when he's starting to get into his position of power that his wife comes to him and says, the neighbor next door is getting kicked out of her apartment you know she wasn't supposed to have an animal she has an animal he wants to raise the rent now he won't even take it if she agrees to take the rent he wants her out can you do something about it so he goes and he talks to the landlord do you remember that and the lord landlord just blows him off doesn't say anything to him it's like get out of here and then he finds out who he is and he's scared to death do you remember that part of the movie so he goes in to see him And he goes in and he, oh, oh, I did not realize it was you. And he starts making all these things out. And someday let's get together and I'd like to drink coffee, but not today, but because you're a busy man. But any time, he really doesn't want to be around him, but he's got to make that show. And then he can't get out the door. Do you remember that? He just can't get the door open. And so the other guy walks over there and slowly opens the door. How many of you remember that? You don't? Okay, Rent the Godfather anyways. Great little place here. But I want you to understand In that culture at that time, you didn't just come out and out refuse hospitality. So basically what you would do is make up some type of excuse and say, I will be there someday. And you didn't even say someday, I'll come. I'll do it. I'll be there. And that's what was happening. Now, here's what's interesting. Because of that custom of extending hospitality, you always had to be ready to carry through with it. You never knew if a person was going to take you up on it or not. So if you extended hospitality, 90% of the time, the person would make an excuse and say, I would love to do it. I want to come to your home. But the missus needs me here, and I can't do it today. Tomorrow. And you don't mean tomorrow. You just mean sometime in the future. And then guess what? They leave. So... If you're in the habit of of offering hospitality, you need to remember that 90% of the people are going to do that, but there's always the 10% that's going to take you up on your offer of hospitality. So, here's what's interesting. Esau had to determine if Jacob was coming or not coming. Because the way he answered at that time in their culture, according to their customs, Jacob wasn't coming immediately. And if he was coming at all, it was going to be a little bit later, but he still might be coming. So he had to determine if Jacob's coming or not coming. So, what did he do? He makes another offer, a very polite offer. The only way to know was to offer Jacob help in his travels to come to his home. So he offered some of his men to help Jacob and to protect him, but it was really just a way to see if Jacob was going to come or not come. And of course, when Jacob refused any help, Esau Esau knew he's not coming. There's no hard feelings, people. It's not an out-and-out lie. It's part of their culture. He had offered. Jacob had refused. 
He given an acceptable uh, excuse for it. And he told Esau, not today, sometime in the future. But here's my point. Jacob wasn't lying. He was just observing the customs of that time. So, once Jacob and Esau were reconciled, they each went their own way. Esau went back to Seir and Jacob traveled on to Canaan. Now, let me just kind of drive this home to you. If you do come with me to Israel, our tour guide will be very friendly and so will our bus driver. And in all probability, our bus driver will be a Palestinian Christian. That's normally how it works out. Our tour guide, which we think we know who it's going to be now, she's a Messianic believer, but they're usually not believers, but your, but your bus uh, drivers are usually Palestinian Christians. And one of the things that you have to watch out for is that as you become very uh, friendly with them, because you spend a lot of time together, I mean the whole time you're just driving from place to place, they'll come and eat with you, and here's what normally takes place. Someone, because of Southern hospitality, will say, well, you ought to come to the States. You ought to come to our hometown. Now, do you really mean that? You ought to visit us. You would love our church. You'd love our people. We're having such a good time. Don't do that. Because that bus driver might show up at your house and he will stay until his visa runs out and he won't have any money in his pocket. That has happened. The last tour group I was on there was a pastor from a town in Texas, and he came by himself, and I said, oh, have you been here before? He said, yeah, I brought a whole group last time. I said, oh, really? No one else wanted to come? He said, I'm not bringing anyone back. I said, what's the deal? He said, you wouldn't believe what they did. He said, I told them not to do it. But he said, we were over here with my group, and one of them got to talking with the bus driver, and he said, come on to Texas. You would love Texas. And he said, one day... This guy rings the doorbell, and it's our bus driver. And he stayed in every person's home in the church until his visa ran out, and then he went home. People, you can't do that. That's that uh, offering of hospitality, but we do the very same thing. We'll offer things that we really don't mean, and we expect people not to take them up on it. But you need to understand something. In the Middle East, there's always that chance that that person will take it. And it might be considered rude, but you still have to offer and then you have to show hospitality when they take you up on it. That's why, if you remember, when Jacob was in Haran and he'd been there for 30 days, his future father-in-law Laban had to come and say, it's not right that you stay here. This was just a polite way of saying, you can't continue to live here without working for me. You're either have to, going to have to go to work or you're going to have to come through and have money. Do something, but you can't stay here as a freeloader. But he didn't say it that way. That's their culture. That was the custom of the time, so you need to understand that. And the reason I bring that up is because we don't see that. And so when we're going through, we look at that and say, look at that. Jacob just lied to him. As soon as he told him that and Esau went home, he turns right around. He just crossed the spring. Now he crosses back and he heads off the opposite direction. Well, he was a liar. No, he wasn't. That's part of the culture. So, let's look at verses 16 through 20. So Esau turned around and started back to Seir that same day. Jacob, on the other hand, traveled on to Sukkot. There he built himself a house and made shelters for his livestock. That is why the place was named Sukkot, which means shelters. In fact, that's the seventh festival, the name of the seventh festival of the Lord. Remember the seven feasts that the Jews were supposed to keep? The last one was known as the Feast of Tabernacles, known as Sukkot. There he built himself a house and made shelters for his livestock. That is why the place was named Sukkot, which means shelters. Later, having traveled all the way from Padan Aram, Jacob arrived safely at the town of Shechem in the land of Canaan. There he set up camp outside the town. Jacob bought the plot of land where he camped from the family of Hamar, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of silver. And there he built an altar and named it El Elohi Israel. Jacob actually bought land in the, in the land of Canaan in order to put down roots. Canaan was now his permanent home. And he built an altar there and named it El Elohi Israel, which literally means God, the God of Israel. Now, who is Israel? 
Jacob is. Why does he not name it God, the God of Jacob? Because he's had this wrestling match with the Lord, and the Lord changed his name. And it means that the Lord rules. Therefore, God changed his name, and from this time on, his family might refer to him as Jacob, but he is now Israel. And so now, because God has fulfilled his promises, he's brought Jacob and his family safely back to Canaan, Jacob is now going to fulfill his vow. Do you remember the vow that he made when he was on his way to Haran at the area of Bethel? He falls to sleep that night, and he has this vision of angels that are coming up and down this huge, wide staircase, and they're traveling to God and from God, and they're carrying out God's will upon this earth. And if you remember, he gets up and he builds this memorial. And he makes a vow to God. Look with me, if you would, in Genesis chapter 28, verses 20 through 21. Then Jacob made this vow. If God will indeed be with me and protect me on this journey, and if he will provide me with food and clothing, and if I return safely to my father's home, then the Lord will certainly be my God. Quite a few ifs in there, isn't there? If God gets me safely there, if God prospers me, if God brings me back home, then he will be my God. And God not only did that, he went above and beyond anything and everything that Jacob could have ever dreamed of. So now Jacob is going to fulfill his vow. And that's why he builds the altar. What's interesting is the Hebrew word that's used here for altar is not the type of altar that you offer a sacrifice on. It's the word for altar that literally means memorial. He built this memorial and he names it El Elohi Israel. In other words, God, the God of Israel. I have fulfilled my vow. And from this time on, I will serve God with everything that I do. And then we're going to see he's really put to the test in the very next chapter.